Yeah, so I, I have changed. I have changed what I was going to preach this morning in the light of recent events. Because um, I, I didn't think the message that I'd prepared uh, was at all suitable. And the more I thought about it, the less appropriate it seemed. So I'm going to talk this morning about being a strong church. What it means to be a strong church. And how we can ensure that our church is strong. The Apostle Paul uh, was preoccupied with strengthening those fledgling little churches that he was responsible for. He says to the Romans, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. And to the Corinthians, he says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous and strong. So strength is an essential quality of a church. And I don't know about you, but I tend not to think in those terms when I think of a church. I look at how many people it's got. I mean, that's terrible, really, isn't it? I mean, I think, but I think we are often sidetracked by focusing on how many members a church has, how many people come on a Sunday morning. Uh, I often ask when people talk about other churches in, in Berkhamsted, how many do they get on a Sunday morning? Have you ever asked that? How many do they get on a Sunday morning? Okay. So I'm very guilty of that. But actually there's, actually there's no correlation between the size and the strength of a church. Rick Warren uh, makes this perfectly clear even though he is a, a, church, a pastor of a mega church, he says there are big churches which are not strong. Bigger is not necessarily stronger. In fact, in America particularly, it's ridiculously easy to create a mega church. And no doubt you've heard of mega church pastors in, in America. Uh, they represent the public face of Christianity, unfortunately, in the United States. The biggest church in America is probably Lakewood in Houston, Texas. And it has 45,000 weekly attendees in three services. So it's actually three times the size of most mega churches. You only have to be just over 10,000 to be a mega church. A lot of them are 15, but Lakewood is 45, so it's an amazing exponential difference. But the pastor, the minister there, he waves the Bible around at the beginning of each sermon and he gives one short quote from it, but he then never refers to it. He preaches self-help, prosperity, positivity. It's really what he's giving is not a sermon, not a Christian exposition of the Bible. It's just a pep talk with musical entertainment. It's a kind of happening. It's not Christianity. So what I've been asking myself recently is what does a strong church look like? How, and how do we make a church strong? Or in the case of this church, and the church I go to, stronger. Because I believe that this is a strong church. Stronger probably than the church I go to. A strong church, I believe, is built on two things. It relies on the qualities displayed by two sorts of people. In the children's talk that I didn't give, <laughs> I was going to talk about an as a certain astronaut called Michael Collins. Michael Collins is always thought of as the forgotten as astronaut of the Apollo missions. So, who's, who's heard of Michael Collins? Look, you know, some, uh, Apollo buffs there. Yes, he, he was in the, uh, yeah, that, that, can, you, can I see the next slide? That, that, that's him, that's Michael Collins. And he has become, he, he, he flew on the uh, Apollo 11, and that was the one that put um, Buzz Aldrin and uh, Neil Armstrong into space, onto the moon. 
but he, did, he himself remained in the command module, and he did several flights after that. But he has become better known because he wrote a lot about being an astronaut, being selected to be an astronaut. And what the unusual thing is that when, when they first decided to put people into space, they thought, well, where, from where do we recruit people who are going to be astronauts? Have you, have you thought of that? Well, that's a, a problem, isn't it? We know, we know nowadays, sorry, I'll stop waiting about We know nowadays that they do recruit them from the military, and they recruit people who are physically fit, have a, a scientific background. But in the early days, they thought, well, what sort of, a, what sort of people should we have? I know. We could recruit from among mountaineers because they're very persevering, they're very strong, and bullfighters. <laughs> it conjures up a wonderful pi picture, doesn't it, of an Apollo 11 command module full of <laughs> mountaineers in their gear and bullfighters. Because, of course, bullfighters are suicidally brave. So, um, I mean, it's just the, the idea that Christians need to, uh, to display those qualities of mountaineers and bullfighters. I was toying with that idea. Because after all, we have the faith to move mountains, not just climb them. <laughs> and also, we have to, um, when we compare the Christian life to a fight with the powers of darkness and with ourselves, uh, we could think in terms of being uh, a bullfighter. But there are no mountaineers and bullfighters in the Bible, you'll be disappointed to learn. Christians, I believe, have more to learn from two professions which were very common in biblical times. What sort of people should we look up to, should we try and emulate as Christians? What groups of people, what qualities would, um, would, would help us to become a strong church? And I believe those two types of people are shepherds and fishermen. Shepherds tended to work in isolation with only sheep to talk to. A shepherd could spend hours alone in biblical times contemplating the majesty of God's creation, meditating on his greatness, which had a tremendous effect, a profound effect on David in the Old Testament. He had time to write many of the Psalms affect his heart for playing, and to explore a deep and rich relationship with God. The prayers he wrote and sang to God are still an inspiration to us. He went further, didn't he, in a relationship with God than many people at the time. And so I believe that to form a strong church, we first of all have to be like shepherds. We have to, each individual member of the church has to be building that relationship with the Lord in prayer. And we know, don't we, that Jesus intercedes for us with the Father. We don't know in detail what exactly he prays for us individually. But we do know that he prays that we will be one with him in the same way that he and the Father are one. I believe that the Lord prays that we will be strong, that our faith will not fail. Just take a moment there. Just imagine Jesus Christ prays for us, for each one of us, that we will stay strong, that our faith will not fail. The Lord prays for us, just like Paul prayed for his churches, that we would, that we would be strengthened. And we don't want to be spiritually weak, flabby Christians, do we? We don't want to just drift along, going through the motions. That's not why we accepted Jesus into our lives. We want to be transformed, galvanized into purposeful activity, to follow the Lord wherever he leads us, to go deeper. There's a deep desire, even in the secular world, to surpass, to test, to challenge oneself. Back to mountaineers, if you, uh, in, the, in the very short window of opportunity to climb Mount Everest, 
And you'd think there wouldn't be that many people wanting to do it. It's a very dangerous thing to do. But in that time, when the, uh, the routes are open to get to the summit, you have to queue to get to it. There are so many people wanting to do it. Why, we ask ourselves. Why do people climb Everest? But George Mallory, who did climb it, famously said, because it's there. But also because it represents a challenge, sometimes an impossible challenge. But deep within us, there is this need to rise, to surpass our limitations. I have a personal trainer, which is a very, I know, you're thinking, silly old fool, why has she got a personal <laughs> trainer? <laughs> I've had him for 20 years, my personal trainer. And um, we do weight training. I have kettlebells, and we like weights, graded weights. And we work on what's called the drop set principle where you do a certain exercise to failure, that is, when, so that you can't do any more. And then you do the same exercise, slightly easier, again, to failure. And you have to keep doing that in order to build muscle. It's the most effective way of getting stronger physically. Working to failure, and then working again to failure. For the in individual Christian, to strive, to improve, to get closer to the Lord. We need to build muscle in areas like prayer, Bible reading, service, worship. I think I'm, particularly, I'm fairly strong in Bible reading because I'm a very literary person. But I know I could do better in other areas, in worship perhaps, and in prayer. I have very effective strategies for Bible reading. I read the Bible through the, from cover to cover in, in the year, and I also uh, study it for sermon preparation, which is a great joy. And when I have a spare moment, if I have a gap between the preaches, I do what I call the Romans to Revelation run, and I go from the beginning of Romans to the end of Revelation uh, in a continuous stream. So. I'm quite happy with the strategies I have for Bible reading. Prayer is, is a bit more of a struggle, and I'm still developing strategies for that. Our minister, the, min the church minister at um, North Church, has a, a rich and deep prayer life, and he occasionally lets slip the techniques he's using. Sometimes he's praying through the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes he's confessing using the Ten Commandments. And he'll do that day after day. Sometimes he's praying through Ephesians, for example. Sometimes he prays using acronyms. The one he did was, was trust, to remind him to give thanks, to release re that for the Lord to release revelation in his life, for the Lord to use him, for the Lord to strengthen him, and for the Lord to teach him. And he uses those sort of frameworks in order to vary his prayer life and to make sure that he's covering all the bases. We find him very inspiring, and the depth of his spirituality is amazing. We're all very much in awe of him, and we try to learn from him. And throughout the week in, our, in my church, there are opportunities to pray with other people as well. All this builds those spiritual muscles so that as individual Christians, we get stronger, so that we continue to deepen our relationship with the Lord, so that like the psalmist, we can naturally and spontaneously pour out our praise and worship, our prayers and anxieties to God. The second type of person who is prevalent in the Bible are, are of course, fishermen. I'm sure you've heard sermons on this. Fishermen worked in a completely different environment from shepherds. Shepherds were on, the, on their own at night on hillsides Fishermen work in a team. They work in a strong team rather than as individuals. They work in dangerous situations where they have to rely on each other for support, for survival. And Jesus, if you remember, chose them to form the core of his close disciples. So what we learn from them is that we need to work together as a, to form a strong church, to strengthen each other. You remember Jesus said to Peter, 
uh, at the end of his um, earthly ministry, Jesus was um, concerned that the disciples would fall away. But he knew that Peter, where well, he had been praying, that Peter would not fall away, that Peter would remain faithful. And he says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you like wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So this is a biblical mandate. Strengthening each other is something Jesus wants us to do. And he chose the sort of people who were used to doing that. We were used to helping people, helping each other in a difficult situation. He chose his disciples then mainly from among fishermen, not exclusively, but mainly. And the Christian life is about an individual relationship with God, but it's also about being part of a team. A team of strong individuals, but a team nevertheless. We need to work together with every ounce of our spiritual strength to stay afloat, don't we, in the stormy seas of this broken world we live in. Bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Spiritual warfare is real. We need the help and protection of a community of believers if we're to grow in faith and if we're then to reach out in love to the lost, the least, and the broken of our society, of our community. That's why we're here. This is a team meeting. That's why we come to church, to worship together, to encourage and help each other. We all want a church, don't we, that is strong. And here we have a church that is strong. But it depends on each of us being strong with a rich prayer life and willing to work together, strong enough to strengthen each other with a faith that will not fail, no matter what we're going through. We need a determination to be a church of people who acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, who are devoted to worship, prayer, reading the Bible, who are committed to a journey of personal transformation, who are enthusiastic participants in mission, people who are continually getting stronger in their faith and strengthening each other. And it requires focus, determination, energy, teamwork, sacrifice. But if we really believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for us, then it's the only thing worth striving for. Now, I'm not saying that this church is not strong. Don't, please don't hear me say that I'm preaching to you because I don't think you're strong. I know that there are members of this church who have a really close walk with the Lord and a deep commitment to him. There are tremendous prayer warriors among us. There are church members in this room who have a vast knowledge and a deep understanding of the Bible. There are those among us who've given unsparingly, sacrificially of their time and resources to minister to people in need. There are brothers and sisters who've gone through really hard times, who are going through hard times now, but they've come out stronger spiritually because the Lord has been with them through it all. There are some who have grappled with economic hardship, with emotional trauma, bereavement, heartbreak, but have come through it with the Lord at their side. Their faith didn't fail, and now they're able to minister to others who are going through the same trials. We have to be purposefully persevering along the paths of righteousness, hand in hand with our Lord, longing to become like him, to do his will in everything. As a church, to be his hands and feet, to speak the words of comfort and hope that our world so desperately needs. We are a strong church, a terrific team, a highly motivated, worshipping, praying, serving community of believers. At this present time, we can feel the church gaining momentum. We're living in interesting times, as the Chinese proverb says. The world is a challenging place. Life is uncertain. But we can be sure of the Lord's love and care for us. We can move forward in the strength 
that God supplies. I'm just going to take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for each one here. Thank you that we are fired with the enthusiasm to, to move forward, to move deeper into you, and to make, create this church as a, a beacon of light in this dark world. And we pray with the Apostle Paul that out of your glorious riches, Lord, you may strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to be strong, help us to deepen our relationship with you and to help and encourage each other, whatever trials we may go through. Make us a strong church, Lord, a place of refuge for the lonely and distressed, a community of believers in which the lost can find a home and the weak be made strong. And we ask this in the name of your Son, who died for us and who lives to intercede for us now and forever.